Great. So, you know, because we have a very full evening <laughs> ahead of us, I think um, I think I'm going to go ahead and um, get started. Um, but if people would like who, to introduce themselves in the chat um, with your pronouns, maybe where um, where you're calling in from, it would be great to get a scope of everybody who's in um, in the room with us today. So please feel free to go ahead. Um, and, um, yeah. <laughs> but without without further ado. Um, thank you so much, um, I guess, first of all, for all being with us tonight. Um, so exciting to see such a full crowd. Um, my name is Nicola and Lovo, and I'm a member of the Religion and Socialism Working Group of the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, as you know, tonight's discussion is titled What Religious Traditions Can Bring to the Left? And this event was really the brainchild of our education committee as a way to start a series of conversations on how spirituality and politics can intersect on the left. Um, in part of a broader project of building religious narratives that can counter the religious right in America. Um, we hope that tonight's wide ranging discussion will allow for multiple viewpoints to be expressed and to have open conversation following on how religion and socialism can be mutually informed. Um, just as a reminder, captions are available at the bottom of the screen. So you can just click the live transcript button on the bottom if you'd prefer to follow along that way. Um, just a bit first about the Religion and Socialism Working Group. Um, the Religion and Socialism Group is actually older than DSA itself <laughs> and was started in the 70s by John Court, um, a Catholic activist in the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee. Um, we have a website, a podcast called Heart of a Heartless World, an editorial committee that runs our blog, an education committee that runs study guides or that makes study guides and runs events like these, and many subgroups of religious socialists, including Episcopalians, Catholics, Jewish people, Unitarian Universalists, and Buddhist groups. Um, so just a heads up, tonight, it's, tonight's event again is also being recorded and will be later shared online and as part of our podcast. Um, so if you prefer not to be seen, please feel free to just keep your camera off. And if you have any questions at any point, um, feel free to put yourselves on stack. Um, so you can just type stack in the chat if you would like to ask it yourself um, following the speeches, or if you'd prefer um, to not ask a question yourself, just message a question to me and I'm happy to read it out for you. Um, so without further ado, um, I will introduce our wonderful speakers for tonight. Um, starting with Tai Kiatikon. Um, Tai is a writer and political organizer based in the Midwest. His work centers around Buddhism, abolition, and democratic socialism. He is a member of the Democratic Socialists of America and its Religion and Socialism Working Group. Marie is part of the DSA's Religion and Socialism Working Group as well, and also helped start the Catholic Socialist Group. She was on the steering committee of the Global Catholic Climate Movement in its first years, and is also on the steering committee of System Change and Not Climate Change Now, an eco-socialist group. Um, Marie just rotated off the Vision Council um, for Call to Action, a 45-year Catholic leftist and reform organization, and finally is on the board of Mary Noel Affiliate. Marie also works on land back, indigenous rights, and decarbonization policy. Um, the Reverend Dr. Clyde Grubbs is a Unitarian Universalist minister who honors his family's indigenous Texas Cherokee heritage, which informs his spiritual understanding. He has been one of the leaders of the effort to organize religious institutions to repudiate the doctrine of Christian discovery, which justified the conquest of Africa and the Americas by European nations. Clyde has worked with the United American Indians of New England around efforts to replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day and building solidarity with indigenous movements to defend Mother Earth. Um, and finally, we have Asad Dandia, um, a Brooklyn-based organizer, writer, and grad student. As an undergraduate, Assad was co-founder of the mutual aid organization, Muslims Giving Back, which was targeted by NYPD informants, which pushed Assad to join the historic Raza v. City of New York lawsuit as a plaintiff to challenge the NYPD's anti-Muslim surveillance. Assad's writing has been featured in the Washington Post, the LA Review of Books, and Al Jazeera. <laughs> He holds an MA in Islamic studies from Columbia University and is currently pursuing a second MA in urban studies um, at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. Um, so now let's get started. Um, if you wouldn't mind keeping your sound off um, throughout the entire event, unless you're going to ask a question at the end, um, that would be really helpful. 
Um, and uh, on to our first speaker. Do you want me to start? Yeah. Nicole Ann, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, it's Marie, go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, you are really, uh, even without me knowing you, um, some of my dearest friends uh, uh, due to our common commitments here um, and our faith backgrounds. I thought about sharing my story or some reflections about how I came and drew from my Catholic background and be very committed to the common good and social transformation and and uh, how I became a socialist, but then it looked like I might run out of time getting to the point about what can our tradition, our Catholic churches contribute to the left. So to cover the basics first, uh, please forgive me for rattling off some things at the start. Um, most of all, I think, you know, we share a commitment to the common good, uh, the better world that is possible. And coming from, you know, a faith background, you know, prayer, uh, it's, it's not all on us or every last bit of it anyway. Um, we believe in the spirit, something ineffable in the interconnection of everything in creation and what is beyond creation that's mysteriously present, helpful, and good. Um, I often pray for those I'm going to be presenting to, and this idea actually came from a non-Catholic person and someone I didn't even know. Uh, it was a person of faith, but um, it, it's been a, uh, you know, a, a pretty neat thing, I think. Um, I have faith because of certain experiences I've had of interconnectedness, um, you know, with nature, messages or intuitions. This has become a lot more common as I've gotten older uh, and, and first occurred when I was maybe 27. So I'm praying for you all and really appreciative of you all. Um, I'm grateful that I grew up with a particular attunement uh, due to my tradition uh, and, a, and an appreciation of communal things, the common good, service and fellowship, um, a consensus process in that setting, um, liberation theology, a lot of lay action in church involvement. Um, whether that's, uh, you know, cooperatives in, in Northwest Ohio, um, Iowa from the late, um, you know, mid, the middle of the, the um, 1800s, a credit union, you know, my dad was involved with at our church, the Catholic worker, direct action, you know, for instance, my Suburban church sent two busloads of people to hands around Rocky Flats, a nuclear weapons site action, um, when I was a sophomore in high school. And it was, you know, sending two of the largest, their largest buses full of people from a really regular parish wasn't a big deal then. Um, and, you know, that's, that's really changed uh, now, which obviously, you know, that's something I think about a lot. But um, this was a, a, a really good background for me. You know, churches have people, space, resources, and, and this commitment uh, to the common good. You know, we have a rich, challenging, even revolutionary history and calling to live up to. You know, that part's exciting and promising. It's also very frustrating at times. Um, imagine family who wants to not have family, but they can also drive you crazy. And one has to deal with being particularly vulnerable to them. So that's hard and sometimes heartbreaking, as I'm sure many of you have uh, experienced. Our, our um, you know, traditions can be real forces for the status quo as well. Um, if you, any of you on the call, have found places to live out your socialism happily and well among people of faith, please email and tell me about it. Um, you're fortunate, and that's a great way forward. Uh, you know, I think of uh, the saints and people who, who have done that, um, you know, like Dorothy Day. She was a socialist and a communist, um, and then she found another source to support her in that work, and that for her was the Catholic Church or Catholicism or other Catholics, and her faith and experience of all that, and she started the Catholic Worker. Uh, and with others, there was constantly oh, engaged yes. in direct action and creating the better world that is possible. 
Speaking of the better world that is possible, I thought it could be helpful to run through one of the most common prayers, um, you know, from my perspective now. And I encourage anyone who's interested to read John Dominic Crossan, um, a, a short, great, more recent book uh, by him is God and Empire. Uh, he also has one like on the Lord's Prayer, which I'll talk about. And um, he's also emphasized, this is really from the Eastern Church, and it's often lost and de-emphasized in the West, the salvation of all as a tradition, a very well-founded tradition in the church. Um, and in the West, some saints have said that too, like Catherine of Genoa, uh, Julian of Norwich also seemed convinced of this, you know, no hell, really. So, um, you know, taking the Our Father, uh, you know, the Father of everyone. So we are all equal, all have dignity. Um, that's all people, you know, we could extend this to all creation. Um, who art in heaven? So in all creation, our world and beyond, holy is your name. You know, some Christians, especially evangelicals, make a big deal about praise. Lots of music, which, you know, can be fun. Um, have folks here heard of appreciative inquiry? You know, coming from a state of appreciation helps everything. Uh, and holy, sacred, this is in and through all. Again, your kingdom come. Some people have changed this to your kin, kin as in family come. Uh, your dream, your vision of on earth as it is in heaven that all need to live and thrive. Um, and that's really our, you know, orientation and mission. It's about delivering justice, that better world that's possible here and now on earth, not some escape plan from earth, you know, to heaven. Uh, give us our daily bread, just what we need, you know, um, Folks may be familiar with the story of manna in the desert. You know, taking more than one needs is, is fruitless and often counterproductive. Um, many of the church fathers were considered communist. I was, you know, pulling out um, really great quotes, you know, from this. Forgive us our debts or trespasses as we forgive others. Um, I'll just, you know, recommend a couple great uh, uh, pieces there uh, from Michael Hudson and do not let us fall into temptation, deliver us from evil. You know, um, the bad things that continue to happen have are, are, you know, become are somewhat mysterious at some point too. Although um, our religious traditions and socialism give us a, a great point of analysis there. Um, one question that I, I was happy that came up in college with some ethics uh, 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 in theolog professor and theologian at that time at a public university that I was studying with, um, you know, brought up who is a saint. And to me, saints are those who follow through on their callings, um, including all of you, their inspirations. Um, so ideas and follow through are a big deal for me. Um, and not being afraid to be a rabble rouser, to find oneself in opposition to the authorities or rejected by those in power in one's faith or society. You know, Jesus followed that path until he was executed. So, you know, to me, the, there's the demand to have that level of courage. Um, so, you know, communion and doing things communally is a big deal among Catholics. Also formation, I've thought a lot about that. Um, you know, for instance, from preschool, what if we started teaching kids that everything is interconnected and our responsibility is to protect this interconnected life and make life good for everyone? Um, uh, the idea of hospitality has also been, you know, part of my formation with the Catholic worker. And, and for about 10 years, we had long-term homeless folks live with us, uh, uh, you know, in our, our house, I've lived in a number of communal settings. So, you know, that's just a, a quick overview. This is a topic that to me is so rich. It would be, you know, rich to have small group discussions, uh, to hear from uh, any of you on this topic, you know, to hear from the other folks who are speaking tonight. And it's, it's really a a privilege to even be asked. So thank you very much, uh, Nicole. Thank you so much, uh, Marie. That was 
so rich. There's so much in there. I'm sure we're going to get to in the Q&A and really appreciate, um, really appreciate that. So thank you. Um, next, we have Ty. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so great of you all to come. Uh, my name is Ty, and as you heard earlier, I'm a writer and organizer based in the Midwest. I'm currently a member of Northern Illinois DSA. My primary engagements um, as a DSA member are through my membership in International Committee, where I serve on the Asia Oceania Subcommittee, as well as here in the Religion and Socialism Working Group, where I help to organize the DSA Buddhist Circle. Um, a little bit about uh, Buddhism and me. Uh, nominally, at least, I've been Buddhist all my life. I'm a Thai American, and so I was raised a uh, Theravada Buddhist, um, although I now identify more closely with the Plum Village tradition. That's not, we can get into that much later. Um, I must admit, I was not very devout growing up, um, so my family themselves are not very devout. I've often told people that uh, my family is Buddhist in the same way most Americans are Christian, uh, that is only around holidays and funerals. Um, I first started to really investigate the faith in uh, 2020. Uh, so not all that long ago, to be perfectly honest. Uh, 2020 was a difficult time for me emotionally, um, as it was for many of you, I'm sure, due to the onset of the pandemic, um, the uprisings against police violence we saw nationwide, um, several events that were occurring in my personal life. Uh, it's like all of these things were swirling around my head from the moment I woke up until the moment I I essentially my just had to force my to go to sleep um, nope. each night. I'm very glad to hear that, Chris. Um, so yeah, suffice it to say, uh, things were getting pretty bad. Um, I just felt constantly like the stench of death was just everywhere in the world all the time. And I was constantly one misstep away from falling into, into terrible misery and suffering. Um, it's depressed, uh, anxious, and furious at the same time all the time. and. Um, I was outwardly furious kind of toward the world for not being the way yeah, I wanted I felt it to the be. the same exact way. All... Yes. And, and inwardly furious toward myself for not being the way I wanted me to be. Um, so that's how bad it was. Just to paint a brief picture, I was at the point of what I would have called a, a permanent despair. But what brought me back from that point was this. I looked inward. Um, I Alicia, decided I would take go it. Go to your room right now. I am on a that faith is real, that faith Go exists. So the first year or so of the pandemic was deeply lonely and alienating, and I don't want to sound nostalgic for it in any way, but one thing I will concede is that it gave me the time and space I needed to really investigate my potential to be a spiritual person. Um, so I took a dive. I started reading the Buddhist scriptures, um, such as the Dhammapada, as well as the works of contemporary uh, Buddhist authors like uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who of course recently passed away. I worked to memorize the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. I started watching Dharma talks and listening to uh, recordings of, of Buddhist chants. And, and of course, while I was doing that, I had this irrational feeling like there was a, an invisible audience pointing at me and laughing at me while I was doing all these things. I feel like that's kind of what happens when a non-spiritual person <laughs> takes a leap and becomes spiritual for the first time. And but slowly I, I powered through and I started to see the effects uh, calm down. I, I found I no longer was exploding with anger and anxiety all the time. And I finally felt like there was a possibility, however faint me becoming the person I wanted to be and the world becoming the place I wanted it to be. That is a place that cherished and affirmed human life rather than treating it like garbage, um, which is which it often felt like and still feels like is all there is. But, um, and to connect that to socialism a bit, um, I will say what socialism did for my understanding of American politics, um, Buddhism did for my understanding of myself, my faults, my worries, my fears. Uh, Buddhism, like socialism, it not only answers your questions, um, but it explains the conditions that led to those questions arising in the first place. And beyond that, it offers you an escape from, the, from those loathsome conditions that brought forth those questions. Um, for example, socialism to me answers the question of why is there so much misery in America, in the world? Why is there so much misery in America? Because the United States of America is a settler colonial project governing via racial capitalism. How do we respond to this misery that we witness in America in its current iteration? By abolishing racial capitalism and implementing socialism in its place, right? That's the question, that's the answer. Um, 
Now, what Buddhism does is answer the question of, well, why is there so much suffering in life, the sphere of life, including the political sphere, but beyond that as well. Um, so why is there so much suffering in life? Um, because suffering is an inevitable part of life. Why is that? Because suffering originates from clingings and cravings, which we all have by virtue of being human beings. Um, but what is also true and cannot be forgotten is um, it's possible to end our suffering. How do we go about doing that? By behaving a certain way to ourselves and others, holding ourselves to certain standards. Um, that is in essence, the four noble truths of Buddhism right there, um, chopped up disgustingly and regurgitated by me toward you as the audience. I, I promise other people can put it a lot more beautifully than I can, but that was my attempt at least. And, um, but, and then that approach kind of has come to explain my life just like socialism explains my country in my view at least. Um, and because the personal is political, it's only natural that I've come to see my life as a Buddhist and my life as a socialist as two sides of the same coin. Um, and I think they really, they come together, they complement each other beautifully, um, if you ask me. Um, Buddha Dasa, who was a 20th century Thai monk best known for offering a book called Dhammic Socialism. He argued that Buddhism is a socialistic religion. It's, it's socialistic by nature, communistic by nature. I agree. And I try to embody that every day. So uh, yeah, that's basically all I, all I have to offer at this moment. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much, Ty. Um, that was phenomenal. <laughs> and um, so really sorry about all of the interruptions. Actually, we're gonna just go ahead and make it so that everybody is muted right now, um, if that's okay, before our next speaker starts. Um, but there is just enriched. So thank you so much um, for doing that, um, for that great speech. And I think Clyde, you're up next. So I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. I think Abe, are you able to check on if Clyde can be unmuted? He did it. All right. I'm unmuted now. All right. I came of age in the 1950s and graduated high school in the early 1960s. And by that time, I owned three identities. First, I knew I was Cherokee because that's what my family was. That was the community we celebrated with. That was who I heard the stories about coming, coming about to being moved from, from the Great Smoky Mountains to Texas. And, uh, and then I knew, I knew I was working class because my father and all his brothers were trade unionists and proud of it. And when they referred to the bosses, they called them capitalists, always with an expletive. So I knew that's who my people were. And I knew I was Unitarian Universalist because that's where I went to church and where I found my youth group and where I found people my own age that thought religion should be lived into the world. It wasn't that it, what it wasn't what I believed that mattered. It was what I did that counted. What I did. My church youth group and I went to demonstrations to stop the buildup of nuclear weapons and the arms race. And, and we began to have a critique of the Cold War. That was the 1950s. And later I was part of a big demonstration around the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I began to have a conversation about the Cuban Revolution. And I also went to demonstrations to support the Woolworths sit-ins going on in the South. I didn't have what socialists call an analysis. I was concerned about war and justice issues and I was mostly angry about what was happening. It was such a terrible thing. And sometimes when the sun came out up in the morning, the sun would come into the room and it, all of a sudden I'd wake up and I would think it was a thermonuclear attack. Now, my family didn't have the money to send me to college and I knew growing up that it was my job to find a way to go if I wanted to go. So I heard that California had free tuition and one could work one's way through the school there. So I saved up my money and I got to San Francisco and found work. Within months, I was a longshoreman working on call shifts. At San Francisco State, I met young people from other indigenous nations and began to have an understanding of my people's history 
in the context of the Navajo history, the Muscogee history, the Dakota history, other peoples. And there were lots of conversations about why, why we didn't find any courses about America's original people in that whole big university, San Francisco State. The faculty said, well, we don't have anybody to teach it. It's kind of a circular thing. San Francisco State had speakers platform in the middle of the campus and by 1964 there were little teachings happening every day. I heard about the struggles of my classmates who were African American, Chicano, Asian American, and struggles that were going on against discrimination and against racism. And I began to hear more and more about Vietnam and the US intervention there. Since high school, I had wanted to become a Unitarian Universalist minister. In college, I was becoming a socialist. In my conversations with other young adults I met at church, they all seemed to agree that being a minister and being active in social movements was congruent, mutually reinforcing. But my first year in theological school, I found that identifying it as American Indian, a radical American Indian, a working class socialist and a Unitarian Universalist minister in formation were not easy to hold together. It was very, it was always challenge. The war in Vietnam was escalating. I was deeply angry at the supporters I found in the academy and in the churches. Now I was 24, 25 at this time and encountering resistance, rationalization for the way things are, telling me that I didn't fully understand what was going on. It was very disillusioning for me, very disillusioning. So I took a leave of absence from theological school, said I'd come back soon. It took about 20 years. And within a few months, I was an organizer for the anti-war movement. And then three years later, I was a labor organizer. As an organizer, I learned to have more patience with people and have a better sense of how people learned and struggle and how to build movements that were honest, uh, movements where honest liberals and folks with radical perspectives could work together and learn from each other. I also was able to see the struggles of native peoples grow and develop. I experienced church life as an active layperson, bringing perspectives more radical than the denomination seemed to be willing to take. And then when I was ready, I returned to theological school and have served three decades in congregations in various parts of the country. I have witnessed lay folks learn and struggle against the war, the support of programs to address poverty and police brutality and the injustice of the courts. And I've witnessed tens of thousands of Unitarian Universalists become more aware of homophobia and transphobia and, the, and be on the side of love for marriage equality. I have had experience of sea change relative anti-racism and given my own work a huge shift in the openness to learning about decolonization and responding proactively to address the special oppression of America's original people. Unitarian Universalists were engaged in service camps on in indigenous reservations, immersion visits where they actually worked and got to know people. And this helped create a, a constituency for providing support for court battles for indigenous nations for some control over their land. As the struggle to control the land became fused with the mass movements for the environment, the churches became main allies and the Unitarian Universalists were more and more deeply involved. When the American Indian nations began their campaign to expose and repudiate the doctrine of Christian discovery, which is the foundation of federal Indian policy, many denominations responded and joined the struggle. In the process, congregations became more educated, more aware that the, what was the consequences of this crusade for a Christian empire and how it motivated the conquest of North America, the whole idea of converting all these people to a Christian religion. 
Formal resolutions of support for the denominational level have meant congregational action and support at the local level. And engaging congregations in solidarity has meant that people became involved, became radicalized, became deeper in their understanding of the role of corporations, banks, the government in destruction of rivers, lakes, lands, and the atmosphere for private profits, for corporate wealth. In my experience with religious, my religious tradition, the Unitarian Universalists have increasingly contributed to the struggles for people for justice. In, the ter in turn, the Unitarian Universalists themselves have grown in depth and understanding of the oppressive and exploitive nature of structures of corporate power. So as a religious tradition, we both contribute to and learn from movements for social change like the Poor People's Coalition and others it's where people become deeply involved and begin to understand things they didn't know before. So there's my contribution for now. Fabulous, Clyde. Thank you so much for that. Um, again, so much to unpack, but um, I'll, I'll leave it to our final speaker, Assad, to sort of wrap us up and bring us home, and then we'll we'll go to some questions after. Um, um, Assad? Um, thank you, Nicole Ann, for that, and thank you to everyone else um, for the gifts that you gave us tonight, and thank you to the 125 participants joining us on a Wednesday night. I very much did not expect that. It's a it's a very high order to close off, but I'll do my best. My name is Asad Dandia, um, born, in bed, born and bred Brooklynite, um, have been involved in activism in New York City for uh, as long as I was able to speak. Um, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share some of whatever little I can with you. I come from a Muslim background. Um, I grew up in a small little uh, dense immigrant enclave in Muslim Brooklyn. Um, and as Clyde mentioned, uh, many of us who grew up working class uh, perhaps were not raised with the theoretical uh, language, uh, but could very much nonetheless speak to the experiences. And that's really what radicalized me. Um, as Nicole Ann mentioned in the introduction uh, to my bio, when I was an undergrad, I co founded a uh, charity, mutual aid organization um, called Muslims Giving Back. You can look us up online. Uh, the idea was very simple. We were all 18, 19 years old, working class kids. Um, and we felt that our mosque was not able to fill the needs of our community because it was just one space um, amongst uh, a very vulnerable enclave. And so we decided to fill that gap by coming together and meeting every week after Friday, uh, after the Friday prayers and putting in 10 bucks into a proverbial hat and distributing it to needy families in the area who maybe needed that help. Um, that work that work continued. Um, long story short, because I only have five minutes here and perhaps I can share um, you know, the details at another event. Um, one of my volunteers confessed to being an NYPD informant uh, working on behalf of the police department to spy on my friends and I. Um, suffice to say, it was, it was an earth shattering situation for me. Um, it led to a lawsuit that was um, advanced by the ACLU as well as a number of other uh, legal clinics in New York City. And I basically spent the first half of my 20s fighting the police in the courts, in the streets, in the classrooms. Um, you know, it's the NYPD, so it's as Mayor Bloomberg once said, if it was his own army, it would be the seventh largest army in the world. Um, and so it was a really tough battle, but ultimately we came through with a number of policy changes. And again, just because of brevity, I cannot speak uh, to the details of that, but be on the lookout for a future event uh, with regards to that. Um, I did want to speak a little bit about uh, Islam as a religious tradition, or at least as I understand Islam to be and how it, how it informs um, my own background and my own experience. Uh, for me, I, you know, I grew up, I was fortunate enough to grow, fortunate enough to grow up in a religious setting where the in post enlightenment distinctions between material and metaphysical were never really um, so, so concrete for us, right, the material and the metaphysical were always tied together. 
And for me, this is significant because oftentimes we on the left um, tend to see those as two distinct and, and discrete categories. But as a Muslim, the Quran grounds me and reminds me that the material and metaphysical need not have to be discrete categories. The Quran opens up the first, the second chapter of the Quran after the opening prayer uh, opens up with Alif Lamim Valik al Kitabula Raybafi, Hudalil Muttaqin, Aladina Yukminuna Bil Raybi, or Yukimuna Salat, Wamim Marazapanahum Yukitu. Translate that very briefly. This is a book in which there is no doubt, um, and it's re refer referencing specifically the believers who believe in the unseen who establish their prayers and who give from their wealth. And this is a, an important, important concept, an important theme that you find throughout the Islamic tradition where establishing prayers is always connected to giving from your wealth. In other words, the metaphysical aspect of it, praying is never distinct or separate from offering what you have of your wealth. All wealth is also understood to be the, the property of God, right? So. Wealth does not belong to us as human beings. We are merely called upon as trustees on behalf of God, on behalf of Allah. And as trustees, the Quran says that we are, I'll say it in Arabic and I'll translate it. Which basically means you are the best of people drawn out from mankind. Why? Because you enjoin the good and forbid the evil. So this is an aspirational quote, right? It's, it's saying that you are the best of people and what makes you the best of people is that you enjoy what is good and you forbid what is evil. This is very much in line with many other religious traditions. Um, I really liked what, what, what Mary said earlier about the common good, right? Because there are a lot of commonalities here within the Islamic tradition about enjoining the good and forbidding the evil being a kind of common good, right? As the last point, I want to talk about the five pillars. So Islam has five main pillars. Number one is Tawheed, which is the belief in God, right? And the prophet. Uh, and then all the other four pillars which flow from it, every single one of them requires and almost demands being in community. You cannot fulfill uh, those pillars without being in community. So the first, the first pillar is the belief. Second pillar is the Salah, the prayer. Prayer is always, almost always done in congregation. You're in many ways um, enjoined to conduct prayer in, con in congregation. You may have seen videos of, you know, the Hajj in Mecca, but, you know, you can just Google prayer in, in mosque and you'll see images of people from all across the world, from California to France, to, to South Africa, to Indonesia, to, to Libya, to China, praying in congregation in the thousands. This, the third pillar is the Zakat, uh, which is often translated as charity but i like to the, the more proper translation would be wealth tax basically um if you you were you were required every believer is required to give 2.5 percent of their assets um as a requirement of the faith and that fundamentally involves being in community with people and giving to people in your community the next pillar is the psalm which is fasting um the most i guess prominent of which is the fasting of ramadan which again is done as a group in community with people, um, 30 days, sometimes 29, depending on the month. But the idea is that you're breaking fast together and you're, you're using it as an opportunity to build camaraderie. People often wonder, you know, people often ask me, well, you know, how are you able, Ramadan must really suck for you because, you know, you can't eat from dawn to dusk and, and it's, it must be really draining. And, you know, oftentimes most Muslims will say, no, that's actually when we're the most active. Right? because it gives us an opportunity to be in community with one another. And then the final pil pillar is the Hajj or the pilgrimage, right? Uh, and that, as I'm sure you all know, cannot be done individually, right? It must be done with the wide, it's a wider community. If you see videos or photos of the Hajj pilgrimage, typically pre-COVID, um, it had, it would invite usually 3 million believers from every single country, um, everywhere on earth, um, praying together. And everyone's wearing the same, same, same garments. You know, it doesn't matter where you're, whether you're a corporate CEO or a worker, you're wearing the same garments and you're all standing as equals in front of the one God. So I like to think of Hajj as the great equalizer. It brings everyone together across all social backgrounds 
and we're all humbled before God. And it is only through servitude to Allah, through these five pillars that we find our liberation. Um, I think I'll end it there. I, I know I dropped a lot of theology here and I don't want to overwhelm, but thank you for once again for having me and inviting me here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Asad, and to all of our speakers. Um, that was also generative, and um, I'm really eager to get into the, um, the Q&A part of, of today's event so we can hear, you know, from more people in the audience, but thank you so much for that. Um, and Raphael, I think you're first on Stack, so um, if you'd like to meet yourself and ask your question. Awesome. Um, goodness gracious. Hey, y'all, thank you so much for uh in, some really incredible sharing and and to everyone being here this is like just super exciting um i guess you know in my and in, in my experience you know uh, the left in religion hasn't necessarily like mixed uh th that well and i feel like a lot of folks like don't really i don't know a lot of people in the u.s are justifiably really alienated by religion um especially among the left so i'm wondering from uh, you know, any of y'all who, who has a response, what are socialists in the broader left missing out on um, by ignoring like religion or religious spaces? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, Raphael, I'm kind of a big, a big um, reason behind our group. Um, so who would like to clap? Would you like to go first? I just want to acknowledge that Catholicism has been particularly horrible, really, um, in the United States. And, uh, you know, we've been going through a reactionary period, and it's, uh, it's really often hard to find, uh, you know, what is good. So, um, you know, to me, it really is like a family in that respect. It's like you're... Uh, you're dealing with the good and the bad and trying to confront the bad, but, you know, uh, give yourself some space. I mean, there's, there's just all of it's, uh, anyway, I, I want to acknowledge how very bad it has been. And also how spiritually enriching, um, like, uh, you know, take not Han has been, you know, in my spiritual life and indigenous, uh, um, examples and, and, and other areas, so. Uh, thanks, Marie. Um, Clyde? Yeah, I, I think that one of the things I'd like just to pull out quickly is that people are so lonely, so alienated in society that sometimes they're going in, just going into a church and finding some kind of community is, is very important to them. They, you can't become a socialist unless you, you're you're thinking about the world about the uh, your relationships with the world and starting to see other people in the same predicament and sometimes churches are the place where people find put that together the the idea of helping out in a, uh, a, a soup, soup kitchen or i call it or a some kind of thing there's such projects uh, or even just the sign of social justice that m m many congregations do is not is a beginning for people to become a social activist. I have seen people go on to do some, some extraordinary things who came to a church and learned their, to make their first leaflet. So I think it's a, it, I think the question was, what are we missing? It, there's, it's the missing is that place where alienated people sometimes find how to become human. Yeah, I love the <laughs> the poignancy in that line where alienated people find how to become human. Um, I think that a sense of alienation really runs um, through our society and religions are offering um, the community in search of the common good as has come up in um, several of our speeches tonight. Um, next on stack, I think we have Sam, Allison, Natal. There's a lot of people on Stack. So Stack, by the way, in case you don't know, it's just a way of like getting in line. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, um, don't worry about raising your hand or anything. Just type Stack in the chat, and I'll I'll note your name down. Um, Sam.
Hello, thank you. Uh, sorry, I was waiting to be unmuted. Um, thanks to all the speakers. Uh, my question is, what do religious traditions have to offer socialists, specifically in the context of long haul work? Uh, for those of us who were radicalized in 2016 or 2017, it seemed for a little while that we might uh, win really, really big uh, in you know five or 10 years. And now the timeline seems perhaps longer than it did before. Um, I have an intuition that religious traditions have uh, an appreciation for that kind of scale of, of waiting a long time for something to come. Um, but uh, I would love to hear folks' thoughts on what religious traditions have to offer for that kind of long haul socialist work. I'll give it a shot at, at, at trying to answer that. Um, there's, a, there's a passage within the Islamic religious tradition called Hadith, which is basically uh, a statement uh, or an action uh, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he says that um, if the day of judgment draws upon you while you have a sapling in your hand, uh, finish planting it, um, which is to say that uh, even when the world feels like it's crumbling, uh, the work must go on. Um, and it is your job to see see the work through. Uh, oh, sorry, rather, it's not your job to see it through. It is rather your job to, to do your part. Uh, and so, you know, activists and even, you know, religious believers alike know this, know this fact, uh, you know, in a very visceral way sometimes that you may not see uh, the fruits of your labor in your lifetime, um, but you know that you've done your part. Um, and I find comfort in that because it, it reminds me that I don't have to uh, have all the answers and I don't have to um, aim for completion of the task, but rather doing my part to ensure that the task will one day be complete. Of course, there's the opposite of that where it can also create a kind of complacency in it. So it often becomes important to surround yourself with people who can remind you that um, just because uh, a better world is possible does not mean that um, it happens without labor, right? It, it does not. It does not mean that it's going to happen without you actually, you know, taking, taking, uh, seizing the means, uh, so to say, right? Um, and so, you know, recognize that you you're not standing sort of um, in a place that's uh, atomized from your past, um, nor are you standing in a place that's uh, separated from your future. You're connected to your fat, your past. In other words. You're standing on the shoulders of predecessors who came before you, right? You and everything that you're doing right now today is possible because of those who came before you and everything that those who come after you do will be possible because of things that you're doing in this present moment. And that's kind of what keeps me anchored. Thanks, Asad. Um, Ty, did I see your hand as well? Sure, yeah, I'd, I'd like to take a, a, a chance at answering this. Now, to talk about specifically like sustaining long-term work in the left spaces. I think um, really for me, what religion has to offer, what my religion has to offer is the only bona fide way that I've ever believed in burnout prevention. Um, I am 22 years old um, and hilariously, I've already met a long list of people who entered left-wing radical politics, burned out and left. And for those of you who are older, I imagine your laundry list of names is hundreds, if not thousands long. Um, but there you go. And you know, the reason I think that happens is because a lot of people enter this space. A lot of people take up radical politics motivated by hatred, um, by contempt. Um, and I'm not like a Sesame Street liberal copy with a cop type. I'm not saying it's bad to have hatred and contempt for your enemies in class and racial warfare. Um, that would be a ridiculous assertion. But you have to also understand that it's just it's just a matter of strategy. Um, hate just can't carry you very long. It doesn't. You can't stay clenched forever. Eventually, you're going to have to let go and flow at least your body is, and it doesn't really care if your mind goes with it. Um, so if you instead base your radical politics via spirituality, 
um, in love and compassion and common understanding, um, it can carry you for the rest of your life. Um, whereas hatred and contempt can only carry you so far. For me personally, what that looks like is this. Um, Buddhism tells me that when I am alone in a room with another person and we're having a conversation, it's not in as it's not in truth two people talking to one another. It's the universe talking to itself. We're a part of one single organism. We are really the same water, carbon, electricity, and some other ingredients only arranged in a particular pattern for a very particular amount of time. And we're in this room interacting with one another and it's the universe talking to itself. And so when I see another person and I despise the things that they're saying to me and I despise the beliefs they hold, I, I have to look at them as an extension of my own self. And when you have to take ownership of those terrible beliefs and terrible misconceptions, it calls on you to respond to them in a way that's a lot more deeper and more meaningful than just writing this person off as a bad person. Um, it asks you to see this person as one who suffers um, just like you do, right? And if you, if you start to love your enemies, um, which is, a, it's the most difficult thing in the world every day and will never not be. Um, I don't, I won't say you'll win. I would like to say we'll win. I do believe we'll win, but it, it'll get us far closer than hatred and contempt ever, ever possibly could in a million years. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that was, um, that was really inspiring, Todd. Um, and there's so much great conversation um, around, you know, these questions happening in the chat as well. Um, but because we have a really long um, list of questions, I guess I'll get to our next person in staff, which is Lou. Um, would you like to unmute yourself? Oh, there it goes. All right. Uh, yes, and uh, if I if I just might say something too, I remember when uh, DSA was first started as an organization officially in the early 1980s, there was a great consideration of using the term communitarian instead of socialist, but um, socialist run, won out as the term that was utilized, and I think that's that's sort of a basis of uh, what a lot of us are, are coming at. Um, I just wanted to to get the speaker's opinions on you know, an issue that, I, that I've worked on personally for some time has, has uh, related to uh, indigenous people's rights uh, within the present day United States here in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, where I am, I'm, I'm on land that was once occupied by the Sianta people. Um, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of tribal groups don't have treaties or anything of that sort, no reservations. But there are a lot of, of sites that are very important uh, in, in different cultures that uh, you know have been overlooked by, um, by, by, by Western governments in the past. And uh, you know, the picture behind me is, is a protest we helped organize uh, regarding protecting a site here in Santa Clara County, or actually in San Benito County. Um, and uh, but I guess. Uh, just want to get like the author or, or the presenter's thoughts on on the issue of uh, increasing indigenous people's uh, ability uh, through the existing environmental laws and other other policies that exist. They vary state to state uh, to uh, to be able to steward both their ancestral lands generally in an ecological sense and also protecting the uh, the thousands of uh, burial cultural sacred sites. Uh, that exist and get impacted by development. I think that's that's an important part of uh, religious freedom that that often goes um, overlooked, but is very important in, in their traditions. Um, I see Clyde. <laughs> I think you have a response. Sorry, I think I think you're muted, Clyde. I think. Um... The fundamental laws of the United States basically say that the indigenous people are wards of the state. So you got you don't you, so dealing with people say that the 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 Massachusetts people, the Wampanoag people, make a a claim in court. The court says that we have jurisdiction over you because we and the 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 the, the original court. Um, court 
decisions are very explicit that this is a, that this was discovered as a Christian nation and that the people here were pagans and therefore they have no right to to any any say over their world. So we've made been over the last four decades we've been making victory after victory in courts to try to get that. But the, when you fundamentally say I can't that somebody can't fish in this river that they've been fishing in for ten thousand years because it's under the jurisdiction of the town and you need a license to do it now, you're no longer treating them as a sovereign people. And that's the whole question. The sovereign is not something that is recognized in the indigenous people. But I think the fighting for just putting up uh, signs saying that this, is where a massacre happened or this is where the, the village was that was wiped out and you know those kinds of things are very important and then getting changing the curriculum in public schools so that that the that they actually can walk and see sites where it where people live for ten thousand years before the invasion before a genocidal invasion I just want to add that I, I um, think the land back uh, movement is, is so important. I, I was trying to dig and find because I, I had heard that something had come out from the Biden administration on, on uh, beginning co-management more. And, you know, the new National Park uh, Service uh, director is indigenous and, and there are some, you know, pretty neat examples you know for instance i think one thing we could push for everywhere is like wherever there is a uh like a, a county historical society or a, a city historical thing i mean we should be able to know about our longer history uh in, in those areas too or or you know the longer indigenous history I just learned in the last week, uh, I saw something about the, like the population pattern here in the middle of the country where I'm from. So, you know, basically the government, you know, took the land from the Indians and then they said it was empty. And then they said, well, give it away to people. So then, you know, since they were giving away land, there was a bit of a population surge. But then of course, uh, you know, um, I mean, it has dropped off again, and uh, it, there's there's just so much to be done in terms of of, of um, you know returning land, Clyde. Something I've wondered for a while is you know how do we how do we support um, that transition, and and like what is your community uh, you know saying about that? I, maybe that's something that you know DSA can pick up and support at some point too. Yeah, definitely. Um, also, just with an eye to time, we are up on the hour, but there are a lot more questions in the stack. Um, so if you have to go, um, don't <laughs> please feel free um, as we've reached the hour. However, um, I think like whoever is able to stay on, um, if you'd like to you know, keep talking and having this discussion for a little while longer, um, I think we have the Zoom for a little while, a little while more. And also there will be a recording um, of this conversation emailed out um, later on. It will be uploaded to the DSA YouTube and sent out. And there will be um, many follow-up conversations to come. Again, this is just the beginning of a series of conversations on religion and socialism. So this is certainly not the end of anything. Um, but I guess um, the next question um, we have is from Karsten. Um, if you'd like to unmute. Uh. First, let me really thank the speakers. This is, this is a really important thing to be doing. Can, can you hear me clearly? No, good, okay. I, I wanna follow up on some of the questions, but I wanna pose it in a certain way. Um, socialists have a long tradition of having a set of values that are not specifically religious values, but are important values. Values like the common good and liberation from oppression and solidarity and so forth are very much part of the socialist tradition. So the way I'd like to pose the question 
is what do your specific, and I'm, I'm addressing it to each of them, each of the particular religious traditions, what do your traditions have to add to the values in the socialist tradition or what particular insights or what particular practices do you have to add that aren't found in the socialist tradition, that tradition that is not religious? And maybe I can just pose this in one other way. Uh, since Marx said religion is the opiate of the people, but on the other hand, he also said it's the heart of the heartless world. So what is the heart that your religious traditions would want to add to the non-religious socialist traditions? I don't know if someone can mute uh, the other. Folks who have a kind of religious or ethical commitment to socialism and, and uh, a, speaking uh, over that's occurring. Uh, and it looks like Clyde had something to say. I, I can add later if there's time to. Um, great. Um, Clyde or Asad or Ty, anyone who wants to go first? Well, I, I've, I'm a fairly good reader of Marxist literature and socialist literature. I don't see the role of forgiveness and, uh, and, and re restoration, you know, the idea that somebody might have made a huge mistake and, uh, and starts over again and, and the community accepts them. I don't see that in, in socialist practice as much as I'd see it in churches either. Just that's a start. Um, would anybody else like to follow up? I, I appreciate the kind of the critique of uh, uh, of private property and uh, in, in the Catholic tradition, the universal destination of goods. So, you know, before capitalism and before uh, Marxism, there was, you know, this, this idea that, uh, which is, you know, we hear is present in all of the, uh, almost all the other traditions we heard about this evening too. Um, so, I guess it it helps us. Uh, I, I think potentially helps us convey core tenets of of mm -hmm. socialism uh, and, and frame it in our uh, some of these longer traditions. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Marie and Asad. Thank you for the question. It's one that I've meditated on for a long time. But you know, I I, I would rephrase it. I would say rather than you know put religion on the defensive and say, well, what, what do you have to offer? Um, I would, I would say that I would rephrase it and say, well, what it is, what is it um, that you see yourself oriented towards? Right. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, for me, it's, it's not a question of, again, a division between you know, metaphysical and material. For me, these two are not distinct. For me, for example, the Islamic tradition offers a very thick sense of community, right? There offers a very um, unique language and set of discourses that I think, um, you know, as Clyde mentioned, forgiveness is just one among them, right? But it, it orients me somewhere. And I think as someone mentioned in uh, the conversation, um, Marxism can oftentimes become a religion in and of itself. Right. Socialism can become a religion in and of itself. And if you are not oriented towards something, something greater than who you are, um, whatever that thing is that you're you're committed to becomes your religion. Right. And so for me, it's. It's an anchor. Um, it's also a source of um, hope and comfort um, and camaraderie. Um, just because of that very thick conception of community that it has that I don't think can be found in very strict vulgar materialism. And so, you know, rather than asking, well, what, what does one have to offer the other? I would ask, well, how do they, how can they mutually reinforce each other? And what is it towards which we are called to? What are we all called to do, right? Um, and I find that these are much more enriching questions than questions of contribution um, or um, the likes. Yeah, um, definitely. I especially like resonate with that line about um, Marxism becoming its own religion. If 
you don't have another belief system anchoring you. Um, I think that's especially true for um, people with like my generation <laughs> and our generation um, uh, today. Um, I guess we'll take maybe a couple more questions. Um, and I know um, before we kind of let people have a, have a great night, but um, I'm gonna go with Chandra next. Thank you very much. I'm so excited to be here. I'm very glad for the speakers. I just wanted to comment, um, first of all, to, I think it's Lou Sharamonte. I happen to know that the Biden administration, who I don't place a lot of faith in uh, political power, but he has, taken great strides with the Department of Interior to try and restore a lot of those ancestral lands to the indigenous peoples. So in the coming year, do look for some pleasant surprises because they've given a lot of funding and representation paid by the government for reparations for the indigenous peoples all across our country. So um, there's something to look forward to. And touching on what the last conversation was about, I found it interesting that when people don't believe in God, it's not like they don't believe in nothing, but they'll believe in anything. And I'm an anarchist. I'm well aware of Marx's quote of opiate, religion being an opiate for the people, but he really just meant to stave them from the pain of poverty and oppression and economic injustice. Marx really had nothing against religion. Bakunin did, but, uh, it, but his treatise on God with the state, God and the state was, post, was published after he died. If he published it when he was alive, I don't think he, he would have been able to separate what we have now, which is the worship of congregations and not God. It's the pastor who's become the God, the reverend who's become the God. And, and so that's where a lot of it has been uh, wasted. What I found very interesting about Christianity was reading the history of anarchism and finding in the early part of the 20th century when anarchism was coming as behind socialists and communists coming into the country from Europe, was that when the anarchists were opening their doors to try and get the people to come to their, to their lectures and to introduce them to the concepts of it, the only people who were coming were priests and reverends and pastors and rabbis and emirs. <laughs> Nobody else was coming and they wanted to introduce this theory of a kind of heaven on earth that these anarchists were talking about. That's what it sounded like to their ears. And when you see it, you can't be an anarchist without a great deal of faith in people. And that great deal of faith in people I've come to learn as a, as a newly baptized Christian is the voice, is the breath of God that you recognize in all of us. And it's something that the churches, many of the corruption of the churches don't recognize and the corruption of politics don't re recognize, certainly the corruption of capitalism. But if we could find a way to share that, um, the British scholar R.H. Tony, I think did it, but I don't know, I propose the question to you. We always pride ourselves on being a nation of the separation of church and state, but Dostoevsky's brothers Karamazov showed me, it's not exactly anything to applaud oneself for. To separate one's foundation of moral principles away from how one is governed. If you separate that, is it any wonder that we found ourselves in the predicament we have? That's the question I pose to the speakers. And thank you for listening. Uh, would any of our speakers like to respond? Uh, I, I appreciate uh, what you shared about, about Marx and um, thanks so much. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say that was so, so, so beautifully said. I don't really have anything to add to that.
thank you, Chandra. That was um, <laughs> that was like really, really well put, and really appreciate your comment. Um, Amazingly. Um, I might take just one more uh, before we'll call it, and I think we will end with Greg Colley, if you're there. And Thank you. I actually just typed my comment, uh, my question or comment in is a, is a, in chat, so it's going to be preserved there. I just want to briefly go back to the uh, the question that that Rafael posed to the group, which is this generally, and I apologize if it's a bad paraphrase. Uh, what can we do to help religious socialists connect better with the left? And I want to make the you know just offer up that I think that we need to start by working internally. Um, as I have been at DSA meetings where I have introduced myself as religious socialist and as a Catholic, and I have been denigrated out loud for being part of the problem. And if we ever want to make inroads outside the socialist movement, I think we need to do some work inside, especially in DSA as, a, as an organizing entity, uh, to help people understand that religious socialists have earned the seat at the table and have something to offer. Now, I think we do have work to do to help people understand what we do have to offer. Karsten's question was exactly about that. But I think, Rafael, I'd just like to, to point us internally for a bit because I don't think there are people who understand religious socialists who take us seriously. Uh, many do, I'm not saying they don't, but I think there's enough that don't that that, that is part of the problem. But I just wanted to offer that up as an observation. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I think that sense of um, religious socialists really being like ostracized in some senses, because um, as has been, been being said in the chat, a lot of the preconceptions about um, what religion and socialism must mean when they're put in tandem um, sort of need to be broken down. Um, Marie, or any further, I, I see you've unmuted yourself. I'm not sure if you have a comment. Oh, gosh, yeah, that was a mistake. But I, I uh, I really appreciate, Greg, that you have uh, persisted and that you've, you know, uh, courageously continued to show up in socialist spaces, even when, you know, uh, Catholicism is a bad word for uh, many there. And our own church has just continually mortified us you know <laughs> so but as you know and as you said in the chat you know there's such a, a great christian and socialist and uh muslim and you know a critique of uh, uh, uh of capitalism and of this privatization and um uh and, and what we learn from the margins and you know we could go on and on and uh and then, you know, we have saints like Dorothy Day and so many others who bucked the system and, and they found some sustenance uh, through this. So uh, I don't know that that matters, but your, your persistence really matters. So thank you. Clyde? Self. All right. I've been unmuted. Uh, one of the, I, I agree with Greg that I've, and I've experienced that over a couple of decades, that there is, there are socialists who are rather um, angry at the church, angry at religious communities and express it. But I think that one of the, the things about DSA is its present moment, we've gone from We've got 60, 70,000 members have come in in the last several years. So we're, there's, the maturity of, of our community is, is still something we're working on, let's say, put it that way. But, and I don't think that, the, that we necessarily appreciate how diverse, pluralistic DSA is. So we, if a person is, got, isn't got this particular version of the socialist manifesto down, they, they, there's, a, there's sometimes hostility expressed. So it's not, just, it's not just Catholics that are religious socialists, but quite often other tendencies of the secular left fight each other. 
So I think that it would be good if sometime we pastorally offered a conversation about how we work as a pluralistic 90,000 people, because we're acting like a 10,000 people sometimes. Yeah, definitely, Clyde. <laughs> That's a really good point. Um, Asad, Ty, Marie, Clyde, any final comments um, for closing remarks? Ty? I, I, I might just close out by saying and, and trying to be as relevant as possible to what people have had to share kind of at the tail end here. Um, I, I have no contempt whatsoever. And in fact, a lot of empathy for people who have an innate distrust of religious people, including in the left and just broadly um, in general life and especially in the left, because I think what something we, we, we must never shy away from is that every single religion um, that, that is represented among us is soaked uh, thoroughly in blood centuries and centuries, millennia of blood, even Buddhism, this self-professed religion of peace uh, spread via conquest and subterfuge. Um, and as recently as the Cold War was being weaponized to, for example, justify the terrible brutalization and murder of communists. And if you know anything about Southeast Asian history, that means anybody who anybody calls a communist. Um, and so you have to understand that it's a terrible burden you carry as a religious socialist, um, but you have to be willing to do it anyway, um, most importantly because there's really no other option, um, secondarily because um, like, like people have had to share, um, we all have to carry some kind of, some, some iteration of this burden. There are terrible things that have been done in the name of socialism. Um, there have been there are terrible things that have been done in the name of human rights and and, and um, equality more generally, and it's important not to shy away from those things. I understand that's a very kind of banal thing to say, but at the very at the very least, what that looks like in practice is understanding and even smiling when someone has an innate distrust of you for being religious in a socialist space. Thank you, Ty, um, for that really important comment. Um, Asan? I just want to end uh, on, a, on a very brief note um, with a quote that, you know, that one of my mentors always says to me is that, you know, everyone wants to pursue justice and everyone believes that they are pursuing justice. But it's important to remember that justice without mercy can become violence, um, which is to say that, um, you know, once you become so convinced of your own conception of, conception of justice, um, and your own way, um, it can in many ways uh, lead to an authoritarian tendency. And we all have to reach into um, our souls and try to find whatever it is we can to restrain those tendencies. Um, and I find religion offers in many ways uh, some of the tools and mechanisms um, for that. Um, so for me, trying to remind myself that no matter what, what it is that I pursue, um, allow mercy uh, and compassion to be my sort of my my, my guiding tool as I pursue justice um, has been has been fruitful for me because it, it 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 humbles me in many ways. It reminds me that you know my way may not be the only way, um, and I think that's really really important uh, to remember. That's all. So, thank you, thank you Asad. Um, Maria Clyde, do you have any final comments? No pressure, just in case. Uh, I think I've probably talked too much. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, thank you so much to all of our speakers um, for and all of you for your amazing um, comments and um, for your time and for being with us today. Um, I also want to give a few quick thank yous to the Education Committee of the Religion and Socialism Working Group who made this possible. Um, in, in particular, to Abe brennan um, Elias Ponver, and Maggie Huang for all of your work. Um, and yeah, and finally, again, thank you to our speakers and um, to all of you for such a wonderful and generative evening. Um, if you are interested in getting more involved in DSA's Religion and Socialism Working Group, I just sent um, a Google form that you can fill out. Um, and you're also free to email um, me or find me or anyone else um, who's part of the leadership um, or, our on, or DM us on Twitter. And we can connect you to like faith-specific subgroups, to our um, editorial or education subcommittees, 
um, and a host of other ways to get involved. Um, and finally, again, this, this event will be recorded or has been recorded and will be circulated to everybody um, through a YouTube link and through a podcast to come. Um, so yeah, thank you so much again for being here and we look forward to seeing you at um, one of our future events, hopefully um, very soon. Um, bye. <laughs>